Hey guys, I'm Jax, a non-book boy, and this is my non-book boy review of The Wheel of Time Season 2, Episode 4. Wow, what an episode of TV, I absolutely loved it. I have a few questions and I'm curious and mildly confused about a few things, but overall I really really enjoyed this episode, I absolutely love where we're going with this series. There is a little part of me that is curious if we're maybe almost moving too quickly. Like, I had this one theory in the first three episodes, and I was like, throughout this episode, I'm like, okay, I have this huge theory, and I, I, I am so confident about my thoughts on this. And then by the end of the episode, it's revealed that I was correct. It, it, it's just moving so quickly, and I really, really love that. I am curious though if like book fans think maybe we're moving too quickly or if this is something that was just kind of like a, a little tease and it was going to be kind of revealed as quickly as it has been in the show. And so we get that absolutely epic reveal with Ishmael unleashing another Forsaken, she's covered in blood and he's all like the blood of the blood and other creepy words or whatever. And he does a whole thing and she's all like hidden and you're like who is she? I presume we're not going to find out who this character is for at least a full two or three episodes. <laughs> This show, going so fast. But so there's an amazing epic opening scene, and I was expecting like a big cut to black opening credits, and I'm reminded once again that the probably most disappointing thing about season two for me is that they have scrapped the opening theme song. For a big epic hour-long fantasy show, I want a theme song. I want to have this big 40 second to 1 minute 20 theme song just play and it just gets me hyped and excited. I love cold opens and you can do a great quick cold open. I used to love Supernatural's cold open where they'd have the, the murder kill of the weekend and it would go Supernatural or like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, very quick short ones. But for a big sprawling epic fantasy like a Game of Thrones, and I'm not saying that the theme was as good as Game of Thrones. Of course it wasn't. That's the best theme ever. But I want it to feel like that. That big HBO epic opening credits like theme. And just to take us through a journey and hype us up for the episode. And I love a cold open. Big opening credits. Really gets you hyped over a whole minute. And just sit there being like, oh, I'm so keen for the episode. And then we go into it. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal. But it just kind of disappoints me. It's like you had a theme song, but now you've gotten rid of it. It shouldn't annoy me, but it kind of does. Speaking of which... In my review of the first three episodes, I got a bunch of really, really great interesting comments from a bunch of book fans kind of explaining things that I had misinterpreted or misunderstood or just kind of missed in general. The main one being that I thought the Dark One, the Dark Lord, the Voldemort of this Wheel of Time series was just some guy. That guy that just like was in the finale of season one and just appeared at the start of this season and I was kind of confused by that because the way they talk about the Dark Lord or the Dark One, I kind of saw him as this entity, this thing that was kind of beyond just being like a guy in human form just kind of walking about being a man and it turns out I had totally misinterpreted that whole thing and he is actually one of the forsaken one of the uh, lieutenants the right hand man of the dark one called Ishmael I hope I'm pronouncing that right apologies if I'm getting that wrong but Ishmael the betrayer of hope the father of lies man has got so many sweet titles he is competing with Daenerys Targaryen with just Awesome sweet titles to throw about and I love it. What a badass. Really, really love his performance. And so I really, really loved hearing all those comments. Thank you so much for anybody who sent those comments. Really, really good to kind of get clarification. So just like last week with this review, if you are a book fan and I say something that is wrong and it's not a spoiler for things to come, but what I've misinterpreted from what we've gotten already, I would love to hear them and I would love to kind of know, you know, things that I'm maybe getting wrong from like a non-book kind of perspective. So the episode begins with a really beautiful looking sequence where the father of lies walks into this interesting looking kind of almost like a temple, but kind of, I don't know, just mountainous kind of things. And he sees a big kind of thing on the roof and he does his magic, he does his channeling and he unleashes another forsaken. And throughout the whole episode, I was like, okay, we never saw her face, but it was definitely a woman with the long hair and just the body structure. And so the whole episode, I'm like, I know, I know in my bones. And I presume, 
obviously I'm wrong now. I presume that we're not going to find out for weeks and weeks, maybe even till like the season two finale. But the woman that Rand is sleeping with is actually going to have ulterior motivations and is going to be secretly evil. And there were so many little moments in the episode that kind of like kept hinting at that. There's one moment where they're on this beautiful kind of ridge of this mountain, this gorgeous landscape shots and they're both standing there and she says a line that like it could be interpreted as something that's kind of empowering in an innocent kind of you know the light side kind of way but because I had the suspicion that she was kind of evil and there was something kind of more to her character because I thought that was the most interesting thing the show could do is if she has kind of ulterior motivations and does actually know that he's the dragon reborn. And she's like, if you want to have power, you've got to take it. If you want something, you've got to take it. And like that can be empowering for like a good character, but it felt like it had sinister kind of ulterior kind of hidden motivations behind that line. And so their dynamic throughout the whole episode, I found really, really interesting. And I, I, can't, I cannot believe, and this is the thing where I was like, I'm, I wonder, are we moving too quickly? Because I wouldn't have minded to have her and Rand kind of have their dynamic where he doesn't realize she's sus. We're slowly kind of cluing in on the fact she's probably going to be evil and is kind of using him and already knows that he can like channel and is the dragon reborn. Or maybe even she thinks maybe he might be. And the, what really kind of clued me in being like, no, I'm 100% right, is when one of the Fady Bunch rocks up and he's all there and he's all like, I'm a Nazgul knockoff, here we go. And they have the big epic fight scene and then Rand just wipes it out just immediately. Just like he channels, he uses his magic powers and kills it so quickly. He just toasts that guy so quickly and I'm like, whoa. I knew that like the Dragon Reborn, they've hyped it up. He's going to be the most powerful man channeler of the, the one power. Like, but to see him so quickly and effectively just scorch and torch this guy and incinerate him just like within seconds. Like there's a couple of sword kind of, you know, parries and fights. But as soon as he channels, done. The Fady Bunch, the Nazgul knockoff, he's dead. He's done. And it's so crazy to see how much of a power buff that Rant has gotten. Now he's accepted that he is now the Dragon Reborn. And he hasn't even been practicing or training. And so to show that power level so quickly, I thought was really, really interesting. But I also had a feeling like he's having a bit of a lovey-dovey moment with his sugar mama. Which also, the episode starts and he's like doing chores. And she's like, hey, you don't have to do chores. And he's like, lady... I'm loving our sexual interactions, but I don't want no sugar mama. I'm going to do chores. So this is just kind of sexual, but I'm also paying for this in that I did burn down. And so they're having this moment together and she is there when the shadow demon monster attacks. And I kept thinking, I reckon maybe she has like decided to like bring this guy in, this Lieutenant demon shadow monster to kind of test him, to kind of force him to show his powers to her and then she can be like whoa 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 what's going on there Rand you've got magic powers or something and to kind of force his hand to reveal that to her and that's why I kind of feel like that was enough for the episode I'm like that's that's plenty that's absolutely plenty love that now my suspicions of that character are so much stronger and I feel like I have enough pieces of the puzzle to really kind of lock in all right we got a woman didn't see her face Another Forsaken has been kind of unleashed by the betrayer of hope, the father of lies. I cannot stress enough, absolutely loving this guy's title. It's just super, super cool. Funnily enough, as soon as I was kind of made aware by all the comments of my last video that he isn't the dark one and he's just like the right hand man, the lieutenant, who's kind of taking charge, like kind of, you know, on the ground. I was suddenly so much more intrigued by the character and so much more interested to see where his character would kind of go. Whereas I was a little confused. I'm like, huh, oh, the, the big bad of the show is just like wandering about. I don't know. I just found that like kind of odd. I was like, what, what are we leading to then? Like if there's no big bad to be revealed later in the show. So I just really, really like his character now. And the performance is spectacular. But then we not only get all of this amazing stuff with these two characters, which I just found super, super interesting. We get this absolutely insane last scene of the episode in which she is like doing some kinky sex stuff, tying him up and they're all having sex. And she's like, actually, I'm a monster too. And it keeps cutting back to these other characters who are reading this manuscript 
page note thing, and they're reading the thing that Ishmael said from the start of the episode, and it's the reveal. She is the next Forsaken, the most powerful, the most dangerous one, they said. Even though I feel like, wasn't Ishmael the most powerful? But it doesn't matter. They're both super powerful, and I'm all here for it. And the reveal where she's like, I'm also a monster. And then she starts channeling and Rand's like, what's going on? I don't understand. And I'm like, oh my God, she's going to start channeling and she's going to go to do something and it's going to cut to black. Classic cliffhanger stuff. And I was just like, like I could feel it happening. I was like, I could just see it cut to a black screen to end the episode. But no, no. This show is like, we're not going to give you one reveal. We're not going to give you two reveals. We're going to do three. We're going to do three crazy things in one episode which really, I, I, like, I, I could be totally wrong. Maybe this all happens in a very short amount of the book. But knowing there are 14 books, and one of the comments last week said they're planning to do eight seasons, and to me that makes sense. Seven or eight seasons, that feels like a good amount where the show isn't being too rushed, but also we can't have a 14 season show. It's just gonna, it's just not gonna work. Shows just don't go for that long unless they're kind of like NCIS or something like that. So I was like expecting the show to kind of really move through things and kind of really give us a lot and just go at a clip so that they can tell the whole story in the seasons that they're going to do. But it absolutely blew my mind and I, I screamed, I shouted, I hooted and I hollered in horror, amazement and just... I, I was overwhelmed, and Moraine comes in, slits her throat, blood explodes all over Rand as he's tied up. Anybody who's tied up about to have sexy times, blood exploding with the lady you're about to have sex with, like, it's got to be in the top three of worst things that could happen mid-sexy times. Like, let's be honest. Uh, the reveal that she's also a monster, but maybe just like a sexy monster. Maybe people think she's a monster, but like not like an actual monster. No, flat out monster. Moraine just slits her throat. Rand throws her across the room with his magic powers. I just... I was overwhelmed. I was like the episode ended and I was like the goosebumps had goosebumps and they also had goosebumps on those goosebumps. I was so excited. It was so much fun. What a huge, crazy thing to happen. And I am a little disappointed that we didn't get more of a trickle of the reveal that she's evil and that we're just going so fast through it. But I, I loved it. I really, really loved it. I also love the fact that he's like, I can't believe you killed her. And Moraine's like, no, she's like super powerful, bro. I, I like, I slit her throat, but she is not dead. And she, I think she says she can't kill her. So I don't know. Are they immortal? Is that why like the original dragon reborn or the original dragon or whatever you call him, Luzthron? I'm probably mispronouncing that. I apologize. He had to lock the dark one and all his forsaken in a in a magical box or whatever. I don't know what he did. He, he locked them away somewhere. So I wonder, are you not able to kill the Dark One and his followers? Like, are the Forsaken actually, like, like a morsel? So you can't kill them, so you need to lock them somewhere. It's kind of like, in a, like a vampire thing, where it's like, this vampire can't be killed, so you lock him in a box, like a coffin or something, and you throw the coffin all tied up with, like, ropes or whatever, and throw it at the bottom of the ocean. So they can't escape, and they'll just live forever but in a, in a situation where they can't escape and they're just trapped in a box. So I wonder if that's the same thing. Super curious if they can be killed or it has to be like certain magical kind of kind of items or things can kill them. And it kind of makes me think of the, the evil dark uh, dagger that was possessing Matt. I wonder, and this is a huge just like swing in the dark, like I, I don't know. I wonder if that magical dagger that seems very, very evil, maybe Matt will end up kind of being at a channel and use that if he ever gets his hands on it again because it, it appears that he's tied to it in some way they've kind of implied if that is something that he can use to kill forsakens like properly actually kill them i don't know just throwing out theories throwing out ideas that were going through my head but overall just love that the idea of her and rand running away and then we see the little kind of shimmers of evil black goo of doom in uh rand sugar mama i've forgotten her actual name uh, and just kind of revealing, yeah, no, she's definitely not dead. Just what? <laughs> what an end to an episode. Really got me super, super keen. I feel like I've started on the high point. Not to say anything else in this episode wasn't really great. But that really, like that whole arc, everything that happened with all those characters, loved it. Okay, so let's backtrack but stay on Moraine for a second. I found the scene with her and Loghain, like really compelling and interesting just on the level of the fact that like she is essentially the Gandalf of this show she brought all the characters into the journey into the adventure she pushed them out the door and went hey you farm guys or whatever go do a big mission 
And she's like the most powerful character we get introduced to straight off the bat. And now she's a character that doesn't have those powers. And Loghain was kind of like the opposite spectrum of that. Like she's a woman who is meant to use, or at least now in the where we are in the timeline of Wheel of Time, the women are the ones who are meant to channel, the men are not. So Loghain kind of had like the corrupted power. But he has lost that power as well. So we had these two characters that are immensely powerful, extremely scary, powerful, like match, uh, magic wielders. And now, though, they are both people who have had that power taken away. So the idea of them interacting and discussing things, like, and just discussing where they're at as characters, I thought was really, really interesting. And I love the idea that she's like, hey, I know what's up. You've met the red-headed guy, Rand. Train him. Show him how to channel. Show him how to use the powers. And if I think you've done a pretty good job, I'll give you this knife. Now, here's where I get a little bit confused and kind of... I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure how I feel because I love the idea that Moraine is going, hey, you do this thing and I'll give you a thing you want. A classic exchange of things, you know? You do a thing and I give you a thing you want. But the thing he wants is to die because he feels like he's nothing. He feels empty. It's almost worse than death to have had this magical, amazing power, but to now no longer have it. So she offers him a way out to kill himself with this knife. Yet... It's not like he's in like stuck in a chamber, like in, in like a, a prison cell where there's nothing. And they're like, don't give this guy even a single glass to have a drink of water because he'll, sh he'll smash it and cut his throat. Like he's given kind of open reign to walk through this kind of area. And I feel like there's like a fountain. So like if he really, really like if he, it was this big magical universe where he's had this power and he's lost it and he wants to die so, so very badly. Couldn't he just like drown himself couldn't he just like smash his head and skull like on like one of the concrete walls or whatever i don't know i just feel like there are ways he could probably kill himself without a knife i don't know it's one of those things where like i might be misinterpreting it but then i also kind of thought even though he's lost his powers is he able to die just in a very simple way like or is that knife a special magic knife that they didn't kind of like explain and elaborate on properly and it's kind of like book readers like, oh no, well that magic knife, that does a certain thing. Like Matt's evil magic knife, like it's got a different kind of thing. So that will like definitely kill him. I don't know. It just felt a bit weird where I'm like, I feel like if he really like truly just wanted to die, he could probably just kill himself somehow. He could kind of manufacture a situation in which he could kill himself. But then I'm like, does he actually want to die? Is it kind of a, a like a, I don't know, like not... Not that he's lying to everybody, but maybe more that he's lying to himself. And then he's like, yeah, I want that knife because I, I don't like anything. But he doesn't actually want to die because surely he could, you know, create a situation in which he could kill himself. I don't know. I'm curious what people think about that. Maybe I'm kind of overanalyzing it and like misreading the situation in which is she's like, you do this thing and I give you this thing. And that's it. That's all it's meant to be. But it really did make me think like, I don't know if Loghain does want to die. I, I don't know. I don't get that sense from him at this stage at least, from what we've been given. It also feels like a little bit of a weird sequence in just that, like, when they did that moment, I'm like, oh, 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 I cannot wait for him and Rand to have a bunch of scenes together. But already him and Moraine, like Rand and Moraine, are like on the run, running away from the evil forsaken lady, his ex sugar mama. And so, I don't know, I can't see, unless they uh, release Loghain and all three of them go off on an adventure, which I would love. Oh my lord, I would love that so much. 2D powered epic characters with the Dragon Reborn. That is a recipe for tasty, tasty storytelling. Okay, actually, no. I think maybe that's what's going to happen next. That makes a lot of sense. Because I was a little disappointed. I'm like, oh, we didn't get a scene with Loghain and Rand in this episode. And that was something in episode 3 that got me really excited for, like, where that, like, story and those two characters interacting together. One person who thought he was the Dragon Reborn. One person who is the Dragon Reborn. And he's going to have to mentor him even though he doesn't have the power of the channeling anymore. So, yeah. Oh, man. I hope all three of them get to go off together and have a big old adventure and they all like, you know, two people who have no powers training the guy who has literally all the power and is the most powerful guy in the world. That's really exciting to me. So, oh my Lord. Actually, now I've said it out loud and kind of let my thoughts escape my mouth. Very keen to see and hopefully see that kind of, you know, this story to kind of go in that way. Last thing on Moraine, before I move to the other characters, we get introduced to her younger sister who's older than her. <laughs> I love fantasy. I love magic. 
I just love this concept. It's so scary and upsetting and weird and just twisted. It, this is what fantasy does best. I just love this kind of stuff. It just makes, it's so thought provoking and interesting yet kind of scary and horrifying. I really, really love that. Like that moment where the old lady, I, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. She's, I, I, I think I remember her from Doctor Who, I want to say, but I don't know which episode. There, there are too many. And she's sitting there and she's like, like the person comes in, like her servant or, you know, someone comes in and they go, your uh, older sister is here. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm just tuned in or if it was just super obvious. I'm like, it's going to be Moraine magic witch lady stuff ah oh, the acid eye so interesting and she rocks up and the idea that like there's these paintings of like her younger sister as like a child like a six-year-old child or whatever and the painting is of her and she just looks identical and yet this woman has aged like 70 years or something just i i love that it's so interesting it's so compelling their interactions and dynamic together were really really great her younger sister that's older than her had this really kind of snappy, kind of sassy vibe. I really, really liked her. There was a lot of good humor in there as well. Even though it was kind of, it was like funny. Like I was laughing, but it was also kind of tragic, which I, I enjoyed that kind of uh, juxtaposition. Every time I say the word juxtaposition, I feel like I'm back in year 12 writing like English and lit essays. And they're like, just say the word juxtaposition like six times in your essay and you'll pass. And I did. And I passed. But it does raise a couple of questions that I have about this universe and about the Aes Sedai. Aes Sedai? I feel like every time I say it, like, 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 I say it four times, and one time I get it right, one time I get it wrong, one time I almost get it right, and the next time I get it completely wrong the way I'm pronouncing it, I'm just going to call them the Magic Witch Ladies. That's just, it's just easier for me. I apologize. So a question I have about the Magic Witch Ladies, like we got with the Red Woman last episode, which I, I think I forgot to mention in my review, but I found it really compelling and interesting. Her son is very, very old and dying. And that, that, that kind of confused me because I'm like, okay, wait, so I don't know if they've explained it at some point, but it kind of makes me feel like in season one, which is maybe why people didn't love it, like especially book readers, I don't know if they really properly explained that the Aes Sedai are kind of like vampiric in a way in which like once they kind of start channeling the one true magic power, they stop aging. But then I'm like, I don't know if they stop aging or if it really slows it down. Because then later on the episode, they do kind of say that like it slows the process down. But then my question is like, how much? Like, are we talking instead of living like a usual 70 to 90 year old life, do they live to like 150 or do they live to like 600 to a thousand? Like, are they more like elves or are they more like kind of, I don't know, like where is that kind of aging process? Like, does it stop and they just live forever? Are they immortal? Is it similar to the forsaken who apparently can't die even if they are killed, which I guess is different to like say elves in Lord of the Rings. Which the aside, I to die, the magic witch ladies. With the magic witch ladies, we've seen a couple of them die. Or at least one of them die in season one, so they can be killed like an elf in Lord of the Rings. So I am a little unsure, and I would love if some book readers uh, could maybe explain it. Regardless, regardless, absolutely love it. Super, super interesting. Reminds me a lot of elves and vampires in that tragic, horrible sense where they're going to have their warders that are with them. But as far as I'm aware, they also don't get that aging kind of slow down situation. So they're going to go through a bunch of different wards throughout their life. And there's that kind of horrible thing of like, hey, I'm a mortal. This is great. And then you start to kind of, you have all your loved ones and then they die and then they die. You get new loved ones and then they die and you get new loved ones and then they die. And then that can kind of become like quite bitter and you can become quite inhuman just due to the process of you living through so many lives, which is once again, another classic fantasy thing that I adore. Super interesting, yet also very tragic. Like on the surface seems great, never dying. Dying seems like it would not be great, but then you'd never, never die. And then that also then becomes not great. And so I, yeah, I love all of that. Last week, I think I misinterpreted, I don't know, it's the, the case of like watching three, like hour plus episodes where you're like, you've watched three and a half hours of content, it all kind of gets jumbled together when you're trying to do the review and you kind of misremember or misinterpret certain things. I swear I remember the power of friendship helping her escape, but there was a little bit of a previously before this episode and I was kind of reminded, no, 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 she's like got her like baby, her child, and she sees the archways, the archways of doom and magic, and she runs through them, she's running through, and then she doesn't have her child in her hands. 
horrifying. Truly, unbearably horrifying. But, even though the fact that that child was a certain age, I don't think I properly appreciated the horror she went through because... I guess because what we saw was like a little snapshot, like a little five minute scene where you're like, bam, she's got a kid, she's got sexy land, and he's all a farmer now or whatever, and they're having a good time. And I didn't really kind of click in, it didn't clue into me, and maybe this is just me being an idiot, because I am an idiot, or it was just them not presenting it in the way that makes it work for me and my brain. I did not realize, and she says it in this episode, which made me really like, it recontextualized last episode and made it way more horrific and way more horrible and it kind of positions her in a really dark place I think for where she's going to go from here but she was in there for years potentially half a decade like maybe longer like she see she gave birth to that child she raised that child she lived in this universe and that is crazy dark that's so scary it's like because when you when you have like an amazing dream of things you want, of things you hope and dream can happen, then you wake up, but you never really feel like you lived that life. And so for her to have this dream, and in their timeline, it's like a day or two days or a week or, you know, a very small amount of time, yet for her, it was decades or a, a, a huge amount of time, years and years and years. It, it was giving me strong Inception vibes where Leo is down in the purgatory world or whatever it's called I don't know he, he inceptions himself all the way down and they live for just like a huge amount of time for like a whole lifetime and so like they know it's a dream but at a certain point if the dream just feels more real than real life like who's to say what is the dream and what isn't and so now Nynaeve is dealing with that same Inception situation. And Inception, just, I mean, a great action film. So everything's good about it. But that core concept of being stuck in this dream world for like a lifetime and then breaking free of that. That's like so emotionally devastating and interesting and thought provoking and horrifying. Just literally all the words. I am so compelled by that idea. And so I don't, I don't think I appreciated last week what the archways of destiny or whatever were doing to her and how it was going to affect her presumably moving on for like the whole show and now with her just being like i was in there for years like even just that one little line i'm like what <laughs> that is so awful like i don't know it, I, I i don't know how you would do it in episode three to kind of really like sink that in because i don't necessarily want her to just be like you know doing a thing that's like three years later and then she's doing it. it's like Maybe just a montage of showing that, um, and maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe they did really hammer that home, but it, it didn't sink in for me. I guess that's the point. It didn't sink in until she just said, I was in there for years. Like, I had that child. Like, it doesn't even matter if it's real or not real. What was real about it? It doesn't matter because it felt so real to her that it may as well be real. She may as well have just grown up with Lan having a child and that's all gone now. And what's worse is Lan's not going to remember that. So it's just really heartbreaking, devastating, and I found that uber compelling and really interesting. And so then Nynaeve gets told by the Red Woman, and she's like, we've got to go save Perrin and the Ogier and do a whole mission adventure thing. And it was crazy to think, like, the three ladies of the Aes Sedai training, they're, like, all walking out, and they're going off to do the mission, and they're sneaking out at night, and then the Red Woman's there, and they're like, oh! <gasps> Oh, no, it's just her. This is good. And she's like, hey, you're a complication because you're a rich princess lady. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because she's going to escape them all. So that's a bit of a complication. She doesn't want to think that she's stolen her. But then she just magics them, throws them against the wall, cut to black, scene over. I'm sorry, what? Did I miss a scene? Did I misinterpret? I, I, I'm so confused. Like, the red woman has always seemed very sinister and sus. But I think she's just kind of a little power hungry, a little kind of like narcissistic and kind of I don't know like very self-assured of like where she is as a woman and as a red Aes Sedai which kind of separates her against a lot of the others but I've never thought of her as evil and yet she has just like blasted them all which feels very nefarious and evil and I wonder did I just miss a scene I feel like I was watching but I don't, I don't know very confused by that but also very interested to see where it goes I, I love it. it's not like I'm like explain yourself show it's like no 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 if it hasn't been explained yet, I'm happy with that because like when they wake up wherever they are with the red woman, they will explain what's going on. But I am also like, did I miss something? I, I may have missed something because as I have said repeatedly, an idiot. So Perrin doesn't get a whole lot this episode, but what we do get is huge 
incredible lore mythology kind of explanations and things. We get a final word for like what he is. And I'm going to be completely honest, guys. I'm going to be very honest. He is not a werewolf. Very disappointing. But on the upside, he's a wolf brother. Love that phrase. I'm a wolf brother. It's just like, ah, sick. I love it. It, it, it's crazy how so many fantasy series can do similar ideas, similar things, and yet they all seem to find like a different word for something I've seen before. Not that I've seen this exact thing before, but I've seen things that are similar enough where it's like, I don't know, I just love it. I, I, I love that. So he's a wolf brother, and we've got our Yoda, you know, the Yoda of the wolf brothers at the moment, his mentor in this situation. And he has a lot of really funny lines. At one point, Perrin's like, am I going to turn into a wolf? And I'm like, yeah, Perrin, turn into a wolf right now. I want to see some werewolf Perrin action. And then the wolf brother Yoda character is like, werewolf, you will not be. You idiot. You're stupid and an idiot for thinking that. And it really felt like wolf brother Yoda was just saying that directly to me, who wanted him to turn into a werewolf. And if I was not an idiot, I'd be offended. But as I've said many, many times, I'm an idiot. And that's fair. Yoda Wolf Brother. Why did I think that was going to happen? Because I wanted it to happen. But it makes sense that it's not going to happen. I'm really enjoying all his stuff. All of the kind of, I don't know, mythology and lore behind the wolf powers. I think the visual representation. I heard from comments last week that it's more like sniffing situation. But I think the visual representation of actually seeing things play out. That works better for a TV show medium. So I'm really, really enjoying all of that. One bit that I did not enjoy though is like, oh, he's like, it's time to feast. And all the wolves start like eating a deer or whatever, like just like raw, you know, as, as wolves do or whatever. And he's eating like a raw heart or something, just like gnawing at it. I'm like, I'm a man who loves a rare steak. I love the very rarest of steaks. But raw? A raw steak? <laughs> that's just, that's too far. And the idea that Perrin is going to lose the taste for cooked meat, even if it is very rarely cooked, as you should cook a steak. I mean, each to their own. Each to their own. But a rare steak. Mmm. A delicacy. Just so good. Ah, uh, uh, just. Ah, uh, just thinking about steak. I'm like, should I just stop the review? Go, like, cook a steak and then come back? No. I'll get this done. Because I'm a professional. That's not true. I'm an amateur YouTuber. But I'm professional enough. All, no, n none of that's true. I just don't have any steak in the fridge. So I'd have to drive somewhere. And I just, that's. It's just not happening. It's so late. So I am very upset for Perrin just generally that he's going to lose the taste for cooked meat and is going to start eating raw meat. Gross. But apart from that, everything he's doing, super cool. And last but not least, let's talk Matt. He doesn't really get much this episode. The one thing to talk about, of course, is the moment where Min gets kind of thrust by people she knows or something. I was kind of confused what was going on. I thought it was a flashback at first, but she's getting thrown down and they're like, use your magical prophecy powers. And she's seeing all these people. She's a child and the child's like, what's my future? I'm so excited to see the future. And she sees that he dies as a child or dead or whatever. Horrifying and just kind of goes through a bunch like a montage. Horrifying, devastating. Her powers are horrifying. Awful, awful, awful. You could totally understand why she would do very bad decisions to get rid of those powers. And I just love that we see all these characters kind of land down, but then we focus on Min and you hear um, the betrayer of hope, the father of lies, and you hear his voice before it cuts back to reveal it's him. And just hearing his voice, his tone, the way he speaks, and just like chills. She's got proper chills. And I feel like that speaks to how great the performer is at doing what he needs to do. My appreciation for him as a character. Now I know he's not the ultimate Voldemort big bad. All of that was great. And he's like, take Matt to this place or whatever. I can't remember what it's called. It doesn't really matter. And she's like, oh, I'm not going to do it. And then he's like, nah, like you are. And she's like, ah, I am. So upsetting. They've made Min so likable so quickly. And then completely thrown her under the bus and been like, she's going to do some really bad things and put Matt into a really bad situation. Super excited to see where all of that goes. Yeah, what'd you think? Big yays? Big nays? A nuanced, mixed opinion?